so we're in part 3.1, so to speak. So we, we now are going to consider the grimmest side, or the most exciting side, depending on your pain tolerance of writing. Grants, particularly NIH. Yes? Can I, can I ask a question from 2.1 first? Yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. I'm curious what the, what the acceptance rate is on the resubmission, the revised and resubmission. Hmm. I would say, that's a good question, because we, we tend to get too hung up on these base rates, these unconditional probabilities of like, oh, this journal, it rejects 80%. So you think, oh, 20%, that's it. But once you start conditionalizing it and thinking of like, well, what might predict this, it starts to get high. So at all journals, a good third of the work is completely just inept and unsuited. And a lot of journals reject 20 to 30% of what they get without review even. So then of the stuff that actually makes it to peer review, probably, so you've just weeded out a third of it. So then if the stuff gets to peer review, a pretty large chunk gets a revise and resubmit. And I think for the most part, if you get a revise and resubmit decision and you engage with it seriously and you do it, your, your hit rates are way over 50-50. I mean, I think close to 80 or 90%, I would say, because most journals are so overwhelmed with submissions that like, you have a fairly high criterion. Like, you, you don't invite a revision unless you want to see it back. And really, either, in most cases, you, you expect to accept it, or you're just really sure that the authors can pull it off. So this is definitely why I think you should always resubmit, because you're getting close to like 70, 80% chance of accepting it. Many of, actually I would say the psychophysiology journals, these are the journals that I love the most, because two times I sent the revision and they accepted it within a day. They just said, but, they're, but from the editor's point of view, they're just saving time, like they say, do this and 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 this. And you do it, and then you write the letter back saying, we did this and this and this and this and this and this. And they read it, they read that, they're like, done, act. Like, they don't have the time to stretch out the drama and write the letters, and they might suggest more changes, but often they just want to clear it and move on to their backlog. So in some ways, I, I personally tend to think of revise and resubmits as conditional acceptances, even though they're not. And the editors often say, we're not making any promises, blah, blah, blah. But in a way, they sort of are. And there's a kind of a code, like in a lot of the health sciences, certainly psychology, they tend to say, you know, certainly we're not making promises, but I, I think these changes are easy to make. Or I don't expect to send this out for additional review. Or if you can handle these comments well, I don't think I need to seek additional input, which is basically like, just make the changes, I'll take it. So resubmitting is where it's won or lost. Like this is where, this is where the action is, for sure. So I would be curious to know what the rates are the Psychological Bulletin, this very prestigious review journal, uh, Nancy Eisenberg, she studied sort of developmental psychopathology. She was editor there for many years. And curiously, she wrote an editorial at the end of her editorship, which was kind of cool. And she basically said, everyone thinks it's so hard to get published here because it is one of those highest stature journals in this whole field. But she said, it's really easier than you think. She didn't like say it that way. But she, she broke down the statistics from her six years as editor and said, we roughly took 35%, but we rejected 35% of what we got without review. Of the other two thirds, like about half of it got a revise and resubmit decision. And what she went on at some length is she said, I'm amazed at how few people revised and resubmitted. Like she said, about half of the people I invited it never did it. Of that other half, almost all of them were published. So you start to see the odds are pretty good, in a sense, if you're willing to stick it out, sometimes do like seriously overhaul a work, or just put like the kind of heavy thought into it. So yeah, that is clearly where it's won or lost. A theme that comes up again with grants, in which also it is in the re revisions, resubmissions. So this, yes? When things are rejected without being reviewed, mm -hmm. why do they do that? Yeah, good question. My sense is, I always see this as like a kind of a mercy. Like it happens to my work a lot because journals I think get more and more aggressive about this. The best journals 
tend to do this mm -hmm. a lot. And it's virtually always that the fit is really poor. Like they're just, it doesn't pass some threshold for them. It doesn't fit what they're looking for. Um, it's either too short, it's too long. It's, it just doesn't have the constructs and samples and themes that the journal is into. And sometimes they just think, you know, it's not gonna have the impact we want. Maybe the scale's too small. It's not something to be fearful of. It, I mean, I'm, re I'm really always happy to get that rather than two or three or four or five or six months down the road saying no thanks. I actually think journals should set a bar of 50%. I th really think all journals should just reject half of what they get without review because it makes life for reviewers easier. It's faster for everybody. It's okay. It's part of, in particular, life when you're trying to submit to the top journals that they tend to do this the most. But it's virtually always fit, because as editor, you think this is unlikely to get good reviews for whatever reason. And so you just chop it. They could have been wrong, but it, it is what it is. It's OK. It sounds kind of cold, but it's really like you're happy when it happens, especially when you're in grad school. And like that three months kind of means a lot, because you're going on the job market, when you're assistant professor. like. But it's generally just the fit, either in content or in length. That's certainly what we got at Motivation to Motion. Any other kinds of questions? Yes, certainly. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, your thoughts on, so if you do have a revised and resubmit um, mm -hmm. invitation, and you know, let's say you're talking about the surprising number of people that don't actually mm -hmm. resubmit when they should, you know, if part of that may be the limitation that they're given, so oftentimes it's do this within three months. Mm -hmm. And if they're given a very daunting task of doing additional analyses or doing all these other things, and, you know, it may seem like, okay, am I really going to be able to make that deadline? You know, how, yeah. how reasonable does it seem to people to actually write, like, if you're getting to that deadline mm -hmm. and just ask for a week or two-week extension or something like that? I'm mm -hmm. not sure that graduate students, for instance, are necessarily as aware of that Mm -hmm. possibly being an option sometimes, mm -hmm. or, or how, how negatively do editors view that? That's a good question. Anyhow, I'm just... I'm That's a good question. It really is a good question, because... Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I just had that happen with a journal yesterday where I had sent out a, a call for papers on a themed issue to a health disparities listserv through an organization, mm -hmm. and somebody called me thinking I was the journal editor. <laughs> I was the one who forwarded the, the things like months ago. And they called me and left a message saying, we're submitting a manuscript to you by, you know, but the deadline's made. Kind of embarrassing. I made sure it was the journal that I thought it was, and um, and then I knew that somebody at the journal had since changed, like the person they would normally contact. And so I just emailed somebody and said, "Hey, I got this phone call. Somebody's submitting a manuscript. Are you flexible on the deadline?" And they wrote back and said, "Absolutely, we're flexible. Hmm. If they have one for that, you know, please send them our contact mm -hmm. info." So that I mean that was just one journal, but the but the response was definitely if they're if they're close. You know, I don't think mm -hmm. they would have waited three months, but mm -hmm. a week or two, they were they were happy they were going to get another. Yeah, I think most places will, will give you an extra couple weeks. Like, um, since almost everything is submitted through these submission management systems that set deadlines, essentially, what it, I mean, it opens a window, and once the date passed, the window closes. It's cold, because in the old days when you sent this business by postal mail, you could sort of squeak out of a lot of things. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, now that we have the internets, thanks to Al Gore, <laughs> it's, it's fantastic, like, Perl and HTML skills. Life is much harder. Now, I'll tell you, when editors, the time limit they give you reveals a lot about how hard they think it'll be. So three months is kind of standard. Sometimes you'll get two weeks. Often you'll get a month. And a month means, really, this is easy. I mean, really, just, just make these changes, not much, and get it back. Three months is probably normal. But it's nice not to have to ask. So you can ask for an extra week or two, but it's nice if you don't have to. Like in my own writing priority system, which is always in chaos, the top thing for me is page proofs, and the second top thing is stuff that has to be revised and resubmitted. Because I think whatever's closest to, to publication, or really it's more like whatever's closest to just being freaking finished so I never have to see it or think about it again, like that's the top of the list for the most part. So I think the revisions, like you would never develop new manuscripts if you had 
when is re revision time because that's just you don't want to lose the sense of urgency because I think what Nancy Eisenberg was finding is this paradoxical but common thing in the science of motivation which is when something see seems easy people aren't motivated to do it because it doesn't feel urgent so it's like oh accepted conditional and minor changes we could do those really fast yeah well so we'll do that sometime <laughs> yeah we'll sit down and do it together even yeah when we have a few minutes together I'm like yeah, like it's just like and then it's asking for a few weeks so it's nice not to have to do that but you can you really can the editors will will reopen it for you definitely but fast the race to the swift <laughs> so to speak yes actually I will say I mean like I'm just gonna be totally candid like as an editor when you ask people to review and they say no that's okay but when they say no and then they send you some work <laughs> or you've recently published, published some of their work and they say no mmm makes you mad now editing it's, it's not reciprocity it's not quid pro quo, but service to community. yeah, it's a service. It's a sense of like a sense of stewardship over this this field of knowledge. It's a sense that peer review is a is a social trap. It's a common dilemma, and that for us all to publish work, we need other people to peer review. And also, it's a sense like at motivation emotion. Like every editor, there's kind of like a group of people who you just can kind of count on for reviews, and they're. They're insightful, they're discerning, they're not making fun of anybody that's like respectful, but they're kind of getting to the issue. And when these people send work and it's kind of on the borderline, is it like reject or is it like a heavy revise and resubmit? You just kind of have the sense like this person's a real scholar, like they could do the work. Like this is maybe revise and resubmit where there's a little bit more. And for some people you'd think, I'm not sure they'd really put, pull it off or send it back to me, but like this person, Thinks, thinks the right way about things. This person would send it back. So revise and resubmit, like you think they can pull it off. I mean, it's, I just think you, it, you really can't say no to journals that you're publishing work in. Like if you see, want to publish work in a journal, you got to review for the journal. It's also a fantastic experience early on because this I think rids people of their fear of rejection more than anything else is that you, it's a humble grad student or assistant professor, you review for a journal, and it's someone you maybe have heard of or is well known, more senior than you, and you recommend rejecting. Mm -hmm. Not because they're horrible, terrible, stupid people, but there's just some problems that maybe outweigh the strengths. And it's not personal. So, yeah. I, mean, I think eventually you'll have to say no to some because you might end up reviewing too much. But again, if you're publishing a lot of work, you should also review a lot of work, like proportionally, so for sure. It's, um, <laughs> we're gonna hit that with grants, which has the same sort of thing of like reviewing grants and writing grants. The one thing with grants is they will never extend the deadline. <laughs> I mean, the National Institutes of Health, they define their deadline according to the hour in a particular time zone, to the minute, to the second. So no, if you're in North Carolina, you can't drift into Tennessee or to get an extra hour. <laughs> mm -mm. No, you cannot. So yeah. So we're going to split the grants part into, into halves because we'll have lunch coming up. So to get a sense of the room, this is a group where a lot of you know, health scientists, so I know some people here have sent stuff to NIH before. Who here has sent stuff? And some people I know have had quite a bit of success, like who's had some funding from NIH? Great. And who here thinks that they're going to be sending stuff sometime soon within the next few years? Great. Perfect. And most of us who think that we're not, like you, you probably will, or you'll be sitting right somewhere. <laughs> Quite a lot of people I've met say, I don't want to go into academic public health because I don't want to write all those grants. I'm going to go work for a community nonprofit instead where I'm not writing grants. <laughs> like, <laughs> fantasy! <laughs> yeah. Really, if, if you don't enjoy writing grants, you should go into academic research where you will write many fewer grants than working in the trenches of community nonprofits. So my own position on this is um, we write a lot of grants and we get a lot rejected and we get some accepted. And so I'm just kind of speaking kind of in the trenches, food for thought experience. I also review grants for NIH. I'm on a panel, the SPIP panel, the social psychology, personality, interpersonal processes. So I review two or three times a year for them for, for many years now. And 
it's hard to give advice about <laughs> grants in some ways because you've sort of heard a lot of it before but tuned a lot of it out because nothing that obvious could really be true. But there's also some subtle tips and tricks. And my own feelings are sort of mixed. And in cases like this where you're not sure what to say, I think particularly the students will agree that the only way to really convey your feelings is with a Ryan Gosling internet meme, mm -hmm. such as this. <laughs> now, <laughs> this. Now, for whom in the room does this like make no sense at all? Like, if it doesn't, I actually feel embarrassed. So, <laughs> if this like makes no sense, this means that you don't waste very much time on the internet. <laughs> but I would say, in some ways, if there's anything you get across with writing grants, NIH or anything, is you just sort of need to decide: Am I going to write grants or not? Like, I meet a lot of people who say, "I want to write a grant," and you should never want to write a grant. Like, writing grants is a lot like publishing articles, a lot like teaching. Like, you didn't do all the training and suffering and teaching to teach a single class. You didn't do all the statistics and research methods and learn all the literature to publish a single paper. It's really a waste of time, actually, to learn all the NIH systems and forms and lingo and procedures and BS just to write a single proposal. It's really better not to do it. It's, it's wasteful. It's, it's, it's just counterproductive because the second proposal is three or four times easier than the first one and the third is even easier than that and after a few it's just like writing articles, it's just like preparing classes to teach, it's just something you've learned that you're good at. And so I think right off the bat, like everyone's going to have a first proposal and that's cool and you're going to be excited about it, but you need to think of I'm going to do one a year or a couple a year or one every other year or instead of teaching a summer class I'm going to submit one every summer. It's just going to be part of my job like writing articles. It makes it easier because instead of getting all ego invested in a single idea that's probably going to get rejected, your mind is always open to other ideas and your mind is open to collaborating with people on their ideas and you're just more receptive to things. And I think it's the only way to think about it, because it's, grant writing is a little painful, especially at the start, and it just helps to, to say, kind of like with writing, this is just long haul, like this is just what this career looks like, I'm just going to do it. And then when your first one sticks, you lose all ambivalence, like, gosh, I think grants are really kind of corrupting, and I'm not sure about the role the federal government's playing in like grassroots community missions, and you're like, grants are awesome! <laughs> I love grants. I love NIH. Like you just, you just totally like sell out, and you're just on board. And it's like I want to drink that Kool-Aid. <laughs> drink, the, dump it on me, like at the Super Bowl. So, you know, I think grants are awesome. So, submit a lot of grants. Like just, just get that, get that in your mindset. Like it's, yeah. Particularly pair up in groups and submit grants together, collaborate. Now, I'd say particularly when people are getting started, I feel like a little psychologist-y talking about mental barriers. But I'll say the couple things particularly make it hard for people when they first get started with grants. Because we all have experience with teaching, we have experience with research. The world of journals is scary enough because you've got these editors and you've got these reviewers. But the world of grants is I think even more discouraging because the stakes are very high and you're dealing with like complicated institutions that have complicated cultural and political roles in science and there's just so much money involved and we've all met people who just have like monstrous numbers of grants and I would say the first big barrier is cynicism so it's PhD comics we've mentioned before love it I still read it so here's an example sort of a cynical view many people have of grants that you know yeah like sort of thing <laughs> This is, like, this is something quite a lot of people um, believe. Um, yeah. It's pretty funny. I'd say that this is like not actually generally true because the kinds of things people are doing, getting grants for, it just takes so many people and it's so expensive and takes so much time, you, <laughs> you really can't. Like most stuff you get grants for, like you sort of really need a grant to do. But with cynicism too, I also mean the sense that there's this good old boys club of 
a bunch of old gray-haired guys, and they're sitting around in some old, you know, country club on the edge of Bethesda, Maryland, where NIH is. They're like, all right, National Cancer Institute time. We've got $10 billion to distribute this year. Well, James over here, he's done pretty good work with the 25 million he's had over the last 30 years. Let's give him another 5 million. Let's see, you know, it's just kind of like, well, look at old John here. He has a new postdoc. He's one of us. Ah, oh, let's give him a couple million. But if there's a sort of sense that it's all slimy and smarmy and the people who have the connections you need already made it. And whatever reasons there are to be cynical. And there are, there are good reasons for ambivalence. I mean, this, the, the political and cultural issues are there. But it's also heavily, heavily overstated. Like, I'll tell you, like, particularly reviewing for NIH, like, NIH takes this stuff seriously, and they are a model for the world in transparency and peer review. If anything, they're, like, way too transparent in some respects, as we'll talk about. When you get your comments back from NIH, you get a list of the people who reviewed it with their addresses. <laughs> and a warning. Yeah, it says, it says, don't contact these people. You can, however, try to identify the most likely three reviewers and send them letter bombs or something. But, you know, it's like... I mean, it's extremely transparent. Like, before the meeting, this will appear on the internet, and you'll see who, who is reviewing it, what the day and time of the meeting is, where it's held, don't show up and protest. <laughs> you know, it's just, so it's very transparent. We'll talk about, I mean, the, the peer review process is completely segregated from the funding process, so decisions about scientific merit are completely separate from decisions about funding. Um, and they're very committed, particularly to, to new investigators. If anything, they're, they're sort of distressed that over the years, the age of researchers at the year that they get their first big grant has gone up and up over the years. This upsets them tremendously. And if anything, if anyone is getting an edge, you are getting an edge as a young investigator submitting your first large grant, because there are certain institutionalized edges that you get. Um, and a lot of things that are developed so that you actually have a, a better chance than someone with funding to do it. So, this wouldn't be a reason to be cynical. But the other would just be simple pessimism. Pessimism and despair, <laughs> right? This is really the same with like, you know, articles. It's, the chances are so low. The odds are against me. Yeah, my office mates and they just get rejected. The odds at NIH are not great. So I will tell you, researchers, if you were to think of like, who we love the mostest, it would be Bill Clinton. Because one of the things that Bill Clinton did, some of us old timers remember, he doubled the NIH budget. And so hit rates were crazy. They were like 35%. And if you keep in mind that I would say maybe 20%, maybe not quite a quarter, are things that really are craziness and have no chance, that was really high hit rates. You're getting close to 50-50. Last year, across all of the National Institutes of Health, it was 18%. All institutes, all kinds of grants, 18%. That's kind of depressing, but then again, it's like anything else. You, so that's to say you have like a one in five chance. You weed out the 20% that have no chance. It's a one in four chance. That's better. Then you keep in mind that of that one in four, probably more than half of them are resubmissions. A lot of stuff gets funded on the first try. People seem to think it doesn't happen. NIH, you get one resubmission. But uh, probably most are resubmissions. So if you send something strong, and then you resubmit it, your chances really start to become pretty good. And if you submit one or two a year, you get collaborative teams, you, you get ideas out there, stuff is going to stick. I'll tell you, I mean, our own, it's sort of like we were talking about earlier, like sort of childbirth amnesia. Like, we have had so much stuff rejected sometimes rejected like profoundly. Like you get the comments back and they say, we will not fund your research, but we will however fund people in your region to watch you and make sure that you don't do this even without <laughs> funding. Like, I mean, yes, it's gonna be sort of discouraging. Actually, I will say that the scientific review officers at NIH, they edit all of the criticisms to remove all snarkiness and snideness, which is rarely there, but they, they take this actually very seriously. And so we're, I mean, me and the people I work with, we're, we're way under 18%. Like, 
we are worse than average. Like, we just submit a lot. And that's cool. I would say in some ways, the people who sort of get it are people who work at medical schools, because you get a lot of soft money guys who will end up homeless living under a bridge if they don't get grant money. <laughs> and they submit a lot of proposals. Many of these are deranged, but I mean, really, most of the worst proposals are actually coming from really accomplished medical centers where people are just desperate and weren't thinking clearly. But they send a lot of proposals and they, you know, you just get a lot of ideas out there. So don't let that hold you back. Now the main thing, and this is what we'll end on before we have lunch, the main thing to think with NIH and NSF and all funding agencies is it's easy to get a little bit too hung up on the agency and lose sight of who's actually going to judge this thing. Because really it all comes down to someone's going to read it and make some sort of decision. So with NIH, the way it works in brief is you're submitting your proposal to the National Institutes of Health. And you're picking an institute. You're saying, let's say I want to send something to the National Institute for Mental Health. And the National Institute for Mental Health, because this is the federal government, has layers, which have layers, have layers. But you find ultimately there's a program, like the Affect and Social Behavior Program, or the Mood Disorders Program. You say, here is my proposal. Don't trample on it. I'm sending it to the National Institute of Mental Health for the Mood Disorders Program. So you submit it there. But the National Institute of Mental Health and that program and the very friendly program officer who can give you a tremendous amount of hope on your proposal have no influence whatsoever over the peer review. And so when people say, talk to your program officer, they're like, oh, but I'm embarrassed because what if she doesn't like what I send? The reason why you can talk to this person and why they can help you is they have zero influence on the peer review and scoring, none whatsoever and much less influence on funding than you would imagine. So this is why they can help you and advocate for you. They really, really, really want to help young people. And you should definitely call them. So anyway, so you send it there, and your proposal gets snatched by these guys. So the most unsexy branch of NIH is the Center for Scientific Review. And this is the branch that peer reviews. So what these guys do, is they peer review everything that comes in NIH. So they organize and administer peer review. They're completely separate from National Institute of Mental Health, Institute of Child Human Development, National Institute on Aging, National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Nursing Research. Like, they are sort of firewalled off. So they snatch it and they manage review. And so what review looks like is for nearly all proposals, they send it to a panel of about 25 or 30 people who share certain interests. And these panelists meet every four months to review the grants they get. And the panelists are researchers, like me, who are asked to do it. They're like, hey, you got grants from us. Would you like to spend an unholy amount of time reviewing other people's <laughs> grants and then travel to the lovely locale of sort of eastern Bethesda and stay at an embassy suites where there's nothing to eat for like blocks around except for a <laughs> cheesecake factory? Um, and the answer is, of course, we'd love to. <laughs> we'll pay you $200 a day. And so, yeah, so you're like, sure. And so almost no one says no, because you sort of can't, and it would be foolish. And so there's 25, 30 people. They're, they're just other researchers who have NIH funding, who hope for the best for you, and wish twice as much stuff could get funded as does. But what the reviewers do is they do not make funding decisions. There's this meeting, and it's a meeting of all the reviewers. There's a person from NIH there who manages the meeting just to make sure that everything goes according to protocol and answers questions. But the reviewers are just ad hoc people who are researchers, and the researchers give these scores. And for reasons that elude everyone except the federal government, these scores are on a one to nine scale, where one is best and nine is worst. But the score that you actually get is multiplied by 10. So it's like 10 to 90. And I don't know why they can't just say like 1.8 instead of 18. But, you know, I'm sure like some senator had a cousin who like was a consultant and needed some cash and they came up with this. <laughs> so whatever. So, so these panels 
I mean, you could go on the peer review thing for sort of forever, and I would encourage you to read this, and I think people from NIH have come here. But these panels give the scores and are not allowed to even use the, the funding word, which our scientific group actually calls the F word. You can't even talk about funding. And they say, we're not funding proposals. We're evaluating the scientific merit. We're giving the numbers. And these numbers then go to the institutes and programs, who then say, here's the proposals we got. Let's rank order them. We have enough money for these. New investigators, going to bump them up a little bit. So when you're on the margins, you actually do get to kick out sort of the old guys network guy, so you can get in there. If there's anything that's really close to our hearts at the margins, going to put that in there. But for the most part, they are stuck with the numbers that they get from the peer reviewers, which is something they have no control over, no contact with. I mean, it's, it's really very serious. Like this, so the peer review is totally separate. Program officers can visit the meeting, but they're not allowed to talk to people or like make faces. Um, <laughs> they just sort of sit there on their, their Blackberries anyways. So ultimately, it's just being reviewed by other researchers. So in this sense, it's not that scary. It's just like journals. The same people who are reviewing the articles and reviewing these grants. So you just want to make the best pitch you can. Like what would really excite the researchers in your area? So even though it's funded by this vast and nameless bureaucracy, you're trying to excite the same people that you excite with your articles. There's other researchers in the area who are sympathetic and wish much more can get funded and kind of hope for the best for you and would like to see, see something good. So with that, we will perhaps begin to feast before we get to, because I think we will need some sustenance before we attack this dark problem. Because <laughs> frankly, I have no idea. So perhaps lunchtime. <laughs>